Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Tick Bootcamp podcast. I'm really excited today to have one of my favorite people co-hosting with me today. Uh, Amanda, uh, I know you are really excited to be working with Nicole Bell. And so let me first introduce, reintroduce Nicole Bell to our listeners. Uh, for those of you who are regular followers, you know that Nicole is somebody who we interviewed on episode 216 of our Tick Bootcamp podcast, and Nicole was kind enough to co-host with me on episode 268. So if you want more background on Nicole, please refer back to those episodes. Nicole is a polymath. Yes, she is one of the smartest people we've had on this podcast, an MIT grad and an author, a mom, and somebody who's doing great work in the community. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the writings Nicole has recently participated in, the videos she's put up. I mean, it's just so much that I can't uh, outline all that. So Nicole, thank you for co-hosting with me. And then please uh, introduce uh, Amanda to our folks. Hey, Rich. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, so it's, I'm really excited to introduce Amanda Elam today. I mean, when I first experienced tick-borne illness, I was just lost, right? My husband got sick. I had absolutely no idea how to navigate this really complex landscape. He tested negative for Lyme, and we didn't even know to test for other co-infections. And, you know, you feel lost, right, as you're, you're newly thrown in as a caregiver, and it's difficult. So my husband's journey, I talked about, obviously, on my podcast previously. Um, and on the other side of that journey, I really just tried to figure out, well, how can I help and what can I do? And I have worked in medical devices and medical diagnostics in my career. And so that seemed like an obvious place to start, right? You know, I want to use my entrepreneurial background to find the technology so that people don't get misdiagnosed in the way that we did. And so as I surveyed that, you know, landscape, the company that I came across that was the most interesting to me was Galaxy Diagnostics. They had direct detection technology and they were based in science and everything that I was looking for to kind of solve the problems of that early diagnosis was really in that company. And so I introduced myself to Amanda. I sent her a copy of my book and um, she's been hugely supportive to me throughout the process. And then actually, you know, full disclosure, I ended up consulting for uh, for Galaxy, and then recently actually came on as a full-time employee as the chief business officer. So that's kind of how I got to know this amazing lady that I want you all to hear about today. So Amanda, welcome to Tick Bootcamp. And maybe if you could just tell us a little bit about you know your background and your journey. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation to, uh, to play today. Um, so my background, um, well, I'm I'm a geek, a nerd. I don't know what the right term is, but I love data. I am a PhD sociologist. I'm really interested primarily in entrepreneurship and innovation. So I'm really interested in how social change works and how we make the world better through business and commercialization of new innovations. Um, so I would say that that's, you know, an important part of my, my background is I've spent many, many years working in startups, studying startups, and uh, Galaxy was my first foray into medicine and biotechnology. And so you're the CEO and co-founder of the company, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. You want the story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, before we go into the story of founding Galaxy, I think I'm sure Rich is going to really want to dig in a little bit further from that so maybe start a little bit earlier in terms of where you grew up where you're from you know what you know all the basics right so i'm actually an immigrant um in stealth mode i tend to blend in um, because i grew up in canada so i was born in just outside toronto mississauga grew up in ontario um and moved to the us um where i finished high school in raleigh north carolina and i went to unc chapel hill um, I'm love to travel and global. So I, you know, was very interested in international studies, um, completely rudderless as a, as a young person and ended up working in a software startup, which is where I really found my passion, um, for innovation. Um, I'm a mom. I have three kids, um, married to a wonderful man for almost 30 years now. And, uh, who's also an entrepreneurship nerd. Um, and, um, so that's a lot of my background. I would say, uh, you know, my sort of personal interests or personal passions really have a lot to do with women's leadership. Um, you know, women are more likely to start, you know, socially focused businesses, but businesses that are really uh, designed to make the world a better place. And um, 
you know, again, and what role do women make in that uh, play in making the world a better, better place? And I would say that in biotechnology and science and medicine, women um, play uh, a largely under underappreciated role, underrecognized, um, but much, much more profound than a lot of people realize. All right. So I am so excited to have you on here, Amanda. And uh, I'll, I'll call you Dr. Elam, at least for the moment, because I don't want to get in trouble with our listeners when, when I'm not appropriately respectful of our female doctors. So thank you for being one of the kind North Americans who came south. We need more Canadians so we can become kinder North Americans here in the U.S. And so talk a little bit more about um, why you found yourself um, as a young person uh, a young Canadian ultimately coming to school here in the U.S. Well, my it, that's all my dad's story, right? He um, spent his entire career at one company. That doesn't happen much anymore. He worked for uh, Northern Telecom right out of college, and uh, we actually lived in Turkey for a while in Canada, and then moved to the U.S. My dad was uh, an uh, you know an engineer. He designed telephone switches, and then became a product marketing person, and that's what brought us to North Carolina because Nortel was right in the middle of Research Triangle Park. So for those who don't know, we have a big industrial park right in the middle of the state. Um, it's one of the top ranked biotechnology hubs in the country. Um, and, you know, and there's all sorts of other technology and cool stuff happening there. So that's what brought us down um, and set me on the journey that led me to where I am today, I suppose. Uh, well, we're going we're gonna to get there. I mean, you're rushing from point A to point B a little bit faster <laughs> than, than uh, I'm prepared to, uh, to, to go. So let's, uh, let's. Walk it back a little bit. So where, where did you go to college and why did you select uh, the college you went to? Oh, well, there's a great story, right? I applied to three schools. So I, I was a very good student. Uh, I applied to three schools, UNC Chapel Hill, because it was close to Raleigh where I was, um, University of Toronto um, and Duke University, because it was also close to where we were. And my dad said, well, I hope you get into UNC because that's the only school I'm going to help pay for. <laughs> so, <laughs> so guess which one I went to? Um, I got I got into all three, but I ended up at UNC Chapel Hill and um, and absolutely had an amazing four years of Tar Hill living um, there. And actually, it was so amazing and happenstance, I ended up earning all three of my degrees there. So undergrad, master's um, and, and uh, my Ph.D. All right, so we have another smarty pants here. Uh, we have a UNC gal and an MIT gal, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't apply to or get into any of those schools. So uh, I will, uh, I will uh, tip my hat to both of you. So, um, talk to us about what you majored in as an undergrad and how that took you through your PhD. As an undergrad, I majored in international studies, and I'll tell you the funny story behind that is that it was a compromise with my father. Um, because he really wanted me to do business or economics, um, and I really wanted to do anthropology or be an archaeologist was kind of a dream. I just loved um, lots of different cultures, and he said, you can't make any money that way, you know, being a teacher. And so we compromised on international studies. My core was econ, um, not the funnest part of my degree, but I loved the history and sociology and anthropology parts of what I did. Um, I'm really fascinated with um, society, right? And so that's where I started. I came out of college. I had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, and I basically ended up going back to Canada to apply for the Foreign Service. It's a year-long interview process. Decided I couldn't see moving every two years because it turns out I like people, my people in my life. Um, and so I moved back to North Carolina, got a job at a software startup, just happenstance, and um, and it was really that was really life changing for me. That first job where I was involved in um, just an incredibly innovative um, technology. Basically, it was uh, building a logistics system that would ship packages um, around the world, kind of the way FedEx tracking works right now. But this is, you know, back in like 1990 when this didn't like we, we had no idea that we could track pa packages like that. And. I don't know, it was just, it was revelatory for me, that whole idea. And then I was also really intrigued with how people come together in organizations, companies, nonprofits, whatever, um, you know, to solve problems. And so that experience, the company was called Encompass. It was a joint venture between uh, American Airlines and CSX Corporation. And um, it just, 
I don't know, it just it filled me with wonder and sent me back to grad school to understand, you know, innovation and, and uh, social organization and commercialization better. Okay, so you so you went after your bachelor's, you went to you worked for a I while. worked for yeah for about five years, and then I went back to school um, uh, for a PhD, um, and it was a master joint program, master's um, PhD program at UNC Chapel Hill Sociology, and I chose sociology because um, uh, one of my professors said if a uh, poli sci professor said if he could go back, he would choose sociology because you can study anything. <laughs> All right. So tell us, tell us how that started to prepare you for Galaxy, and how long after you earned your PhD did you um, did you begin Galaxy? You know, I would say that my PhD prepared me in three ways for Galaxy. Right, one was the data, so the research methodology, learning how to do advanced statistics, um, design and understand studies, gave me a really good foundation. For example, the foray into to medical research. Um, I would say the second piece, of course, is that uh, topically I was studying entrepreneurship and innovation, so I was really interested in and what those processes look like, what the startup um, life looks like, and my dissertation focused on that. Um, and uh, you know, and I would say really the third piece of it um, is so much of sociology studying human organization is about things like social movements. And I don't think there's a better term to describe what's happening in the tick-borne disease community or what's happened over the last 30 years, because it's been grassroots. We've had to we have had to build it up from you know the bottom. Um, and I would like to think we're hitting a tipping point and we've built some considerable momentum at this point. Um, but so I think I think again, sociology about social movements the data training, and then the actual innovation and business startup processes. So one of the things I want to talk to you about since you shared with us what you had written your dissertation on is the reaction that some folks in the in the Lyme disease community have to entrepreneurs. Um, we, we seem to have a group of people who are critical of people who are serving the community as entrepreneurs as opposed to serving in not-for-profits or serving for free. Talk right. to us about why you think the entrepreneurial model is the best model for serving folks in the tick-borne community. Well, I don't think it's the only model, but right. I think it's an important part of the process. And you know, as you know, someone's still engaged in higher education, my my appointment right now is um, is at Babson College in Massachusetts. You know, I still engage regularly with college students and um, and, you know, we were really kind of faced with a lot of, I don't know, some people might call it anti-capitalism right now. Just this concern about the prof profit motive, a big concern about conflict of interest. So there's a lot of suspicion around people who are starting commercial entities, right? At the same time, you know, when I participated recently, um, you know, as part of the a federal tick-borne disease working group program, nobody was talking about the commercialization piece of it. And it's really important for people to understand that we can we can generate all the solutions we want to the problem, but ultimately the way we deliver them into clinical practice and make them available to patients and physicians is through business and so we sell them and so we have to understand what that commercialization process looks like and we really have to have a basic understanding what the business models look like and i mean we spent a lot of time talking about how american healthcare is broken um right and there's a lot of complex stuff there around price pressures and and that but uh and big pharma and and all of that but ultimately you, we should always have some hope and take faith in the fact that there are a lot of really good people making big sacrifices in order to translate clinical solutions into practice for clinical care. And, you know, and I think we would count ourselves among the, the good group of people out there trying to do it, you know, in the best way possible um, in this complex system that we call American healthcare. 
Yeah, Dr. Elam, you did a really nice job of politely answering my question, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit here because I think we I think we need to be a little bit more aggressive about this, right? Yep. So I agree with you. I, I did ask you, my question was, why is the entrepreneurial model the best model? And you said, well, it's not the only model. And then you danced around that a little bit, but I'm going to bring you back. And I'm going to argue to you that the entrepreneurial model is the best model. I'll argue to you it's the most important model. And I believe that we should be encouraging more people in the Tickpoint community to look at the entre entrepreneurial model. Now, we understand there's an offer profit model, and that model dominates most of the work that's being done in the in the tick-borne illness community. We understand there is a medical model, and we have, by the way, I think that's a, a business model, but we have doctors who are given certainly a pass when they're charging for their services. We have we have academics, and a lot of people argue that academics are not really um uh you know business professionals, but it's not true. We all know that. If you're going to get tenure, it's not just publish or, or perish. It's also raise the money to publish and do the research that you need to do, right? So it's it's underlying every single model. But I'd argue that the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial model is the best model because it's the only place where you can get feedback from the people you're serving. The flaw, in my view, with the not-for-profit model, and I've spent a lot of time in that arena during my career, is that there is not a direct information flow from the people you're serving and the people who are paying right whereas when you are in the entrepreneurial model if you at galaxy aren't doing a good job guess what happens no one buys your product if they don't buy your product you have to innovate and change and you have to meet the needs of the of the people you're serving so respond to my argument and see if see if we either agree i totally see where argument. you're coming from and you know what there's arrogance in terms of customers in the market, both on the nonprofit side and on the for-profit side. So, you know, and I think we, we've we heard those terms, the customer's always right. Well, in your, to your point, in the, the for-profit model, um, the customer's typically the one who's paying, right? And so if they don't like what you're doing, they're going to go spend their money somewhere else, or they're not going to spend their money at all, right? Because you're, you don't have a solution to solving a problem for them um, or doing a job for them. Um, on the nonprofit side, very often, again, this comes to the business model, a lot of nonprofit models, their fundraising is something you do apart from the service delivery to your constituents. Um, and so that's where you get that disconnect. There isn't a lot of uh, the arrogance plays out. Sometimes it's ignorance because they aren't paying attention to the to the idea of are they delivering the right solutions to those constituents? That's probably what you've experienced, Rich. But on the on the business side, that same thing falls apart, right? That's why in the startup world, we have this, that one model, for example, lean startup, and the whole idea that you that you bring a minimum viable product to the market, and the way you develop it is through this process called agile development, which really came from software, but you work with your customers to develop the product and, and to create something that it has a really tight product market fit. Right. And that only happens when you're getting feedback at every step in the process from the people who you're serving. And I would say that's one of the things that Galaxy has done very differently um, from a lot of other uh, companies out there is that that we're out there, we're working really closely and not just with the patients and clinicians um, that we are selling testing to, because we make money in, in you know three basic ways. Right. We sell to we, we sell to for patient care. Right. Physicians order tests veterinarians order tests so we're also serving an animal health market and we also um we also uh provide testing to support clinical research studies so research services so the researchers as well and we're very close to each of those markets at the same time the complexity of healthcare and lab medicine we also have to pay attention to the regulators to the guideline writer, writers to the insurance companies and so who pays for lab testing. I mean, we'd like to say it's the patient, they pay a portion of it, right? But insurance companies put tons of gatekeeping and rules, you know, in place around that. And the government, of course, is right smack in the middle of that because all the private insurance companies base what they do off of what CMS determinations are. And so I don't know, that's part of the, that whole complexity of it. And yeah. And I would say that that's something that a lot of healthcare consumers, health consumers that they don't necessarily realize. And that is that, you know, businesses, especially labs, especially are operating in this context, but in a market that's locked down through contracting, right? So we've done, for example, we've gone out to medical centers and we've done grand rounds 
lectures and physicians come up afterwards and they say the research you're doing is fantastic how do we get access to your testing and the answer is well you know physician as a licensed physician you can order and it's like no 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 we have you know a preferred provider list and we can only order testing from the big labs because that's what insurance the labs that are covered under individual insurance plan like all this the physicians can't even figure out how to access the innovations right and then you get into state licensing and all this other complexity um as well okay so let's now talk about outcomes and, and i'd argue that the entrepreneurial model is the model that allows patients to get the best outcome because not only are you now driven to serve as you're developing, and I love the agile model, as you're developing the products for the people you're serving, you're, you're, you're co-developing them with the people who are who are utilizing the product. So you're, they're getting served better by you. But then we have the other pieces. So one of the things we learned, for example, from one of our past guests named John Tubbs is he was actually very critical of the insurance model. And he argued that the insurance model makes it less likely that people are going to be as demanding of their physicians as they would be if they were paying themselves, right? And because we have this, we have, again, this, this split between the people who are providing the service and the people who are paying for the service, gaslighting is happening uh, on, on a regular basis when people are interfacing with it. There with their physicians. And John had argued that the reason, well, one of the reasons why we accept gaslighting at the rate that we do, not only because doctors are incentivized to gaslight us because we're not paying them, is because we're not paying the bill. And because we're not paying the bill, we're, we're being more open to or more accepting of the gaslighting. So if we have this closer relationship with the entrepreneurial model where we have somebody who's serving us as developing the product and co-creating the product with us, and we're being more demanding because we're paying for it, then I would argue that we would get a better outcome than we're getting in the current system. What's your reaction to that? I completely Dr. agree. And that's why my family has a major medical plan, right? I have a budget an annual budget for healthcare expenses, um, you know, and, I, and, a, and enough money to cover, you know, that minimum. And what that means is that I'm more likely to price shop, quality shop, shop for convenience. Um, and, and I mean, there's a great book that was written by Clayton Christensen and a couple of colleagues uh, um, out of Harvard Business School a number of years ago called The Innovator's Prescription. They really looked at uh, the business models that underlie healthcare. And what they were predicting, it took them 10 years to write the book. And what they were predicting really was that, um, that, that a shift towards major medical plans would um, really transform medicine in a very positive way for patients, that the current transactional clinical models that are run, like you can think about urgent care where you don't really know your doctor or even, you know, um, the specialty labs are really run on a how many patients can we get on a repeat visit kind of so they don't do any diagnosis and, and really in the specialty that 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 kind of transactional model doesn't work well for managing chronic disease that we need something more integrative um and you know and i think the health field has really struggled with that like co the coordination of care right there's just tons of stuff out there around this whole idea and i remember the ama probably about 10 years ago now did a study where they were polling patients to find out who coordinates care for them is it your insurance company is it your primary care provider and the answer was no we do it ourselves because our providers don't talk to each other they don't talk to the insurance nobody's coordinating our care we're coordinating our care so major medical um these patient forums are have been really revolutionary for healthcare. patients are gaining efficiencies by talking to each other now there's a lot of danger, right, with Dr. Google and talking and taking up every possible idea. Um, but I think there's a big shift towards this concierge model, right? This idea where direct access is another term used for it, where doctors are creating sub subscription model. They can keep the number of patients they deal with lower. You can have email access. You can, I mean, I love that idea. The idea that you know, that, that my doctor is going to have enough time to troubleshoot something that might be complicated that I would bring to, to him or her, right? Um, so I, I do think that there's some some hope in, in the way the models are, sh are shifting um, that way. And I'll say the third element that was in Innovator's prescription was a shift to sort of individualized care and precision diagnostics. 
So that whole idea that with whether it's genomics or in our case, we're really looking at the role of infection and, and chronic illness, um, you know, what role are latent infections playing and, and some of the diagnoses that people are receiving around immune mediated disease. And I, and I think that there's like a whole new frontier of medicine that's a combination of, you know, distancing ourselves from insurance creating more consultative business models around chronic illness and, and even routine wellness care, right? Closer relationships with our medical consultants. And then this whole idea of um, how we can use testing to really support and drive um, individualized care, which is keeping people healthy in as much as it is treating disease. Okay, so let's pause there for a second. Uh, because I'm getting really excited, but I have taken us off on a bit of a tangent. I can't I can <laughs> somebody whose dissertation is on entrepreneurship and innovation. But let's come back to let's come back to that window of your life between when you graduated with your PhD and when you finally started uh, or you 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 co-founded Galaxy. Give us what you were doing in your life during that window of time. Um, well, it was a pretty short window. So I finished my dissertation in 2006, and I did two years of postdocs, one in Australia and one up at, at Babson, Massachusetts. And I was on the market, and you'll remember what was happening in 2008. It was not a good time to find a job in academia, so I actually um, uh, accepted an uh, adjunct position at NC State and figured I would keep up with the research and at least start teaching. Um, and that's when I met my co-founders um, at the vet school at North Carolina State University and heard about the work that they were doing or very early emerging infectious disease, um, you know, sort of research geek that I am. I threw myself into PubMed and I walked away with um, an understanding that what they were doing was going to be play a transformative role in, in medicine, but the idea of, you know, Bartonella infections where we started. Right. And uh, and that th that we have just the tools that we have today are advancing discoveries in infectious disease in really profound ways. We learned a ton out of HIV. We've learned even more now out of COVID. Um, and I just saw it all as inevitable. That's the word I walked away with. This is inevitable. Now, what I didn't know is I didn't know how quickly, um, you know, the these these new discoveries could be translated into practice um and what i've come to find out and i think nicole is probably going to chuckle when she thinks about this is that changing clinical practice is probably the hardest thing to do like in any market i've ever worked with um changing market behavior changing clinical practice is really really difficult right physicians face a lot of liability they're overwhelmed, they're burnt out, they can barely, we're generating knowledge at a far, far faster pace than we can actually, than people can actually learn it, mm -hmm. um, right? And just incredibly challenging. Well, talk about, before we go to changing clinical practice, because you haven't quite founded the company yet, right? I'm gonna play a little bit of Rich and push you oh. back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, I mean, talk about the early days of the company, right? Because you're 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 working with Dr. Braishwart, right? And Ricardo Maggi, uh, Dr. Ricardo Maggi, who are at NC State. They've got interesting technology and are looking at diagnostics for infectious disease. But, you know, talk about that formation of the company, because there's an interesting story there that I know that is kind of fun to tell. Well, I think that I'll go back even before I came kind of on the scene, and that is that, um, uh, you know, Dr. Breitschwert and Ricardo Maggi are doing their great research at NC State, and Dr. Breitschwert's oldest son was actually a law student at UNC and was looking for, wanted to participate in an entrepreneurship program, launched the venture at UNC and went to his dad and said, give me an idea. That's where the first business plan came from. His Brett and, the, and his friend Jonathan, or his, his um, co-student Jonathan basically pitched it in this competition and it attracted a lot of interest as something that was, you know, a serious, could be a serious um, business. So that's, that's the company. So then Ed and Ricardo proceed to get it incorporated and, um, and they're trying to pitch the technology that they're testing that is driving discovery and research. They're trying to pitch it to the big companies. And the answer is the big companies don't innovate. They acquire innovation. And these days, they don't usually acquire it out of a university lab, right? They wait until it's spun out into a company, 
until you have well-established proof of um, principle, you've got a clear clinical offering and you've got a market that's five to 10 million in revenue. That's when they start to get interested in what they're doing. And so we actually have, you know, like a big chasm or a big gap, you know, in our innovation pipeline when it comes to what's happening in universities, what's happening in small companies, and then this like, you know, empty space before what you run at serious global scale. So they approach you and, you know, basically say, hey, would you like to help us out in this venture? And you fortunately say yes. <laughs> I think the story is a little bit. So one of the judges in the launch of the venture program, Chris Kelly, was a friend of, um, of mine and my husband's. And Chris and my husband go off and have lunch and Cliff's talking about, you know, miserable job market for Amanda. And Chris says, oh, I have the startup I'm working at. We need a, we need a grown up to come in and actually get this thing up and going. So it was the two of them who came back to me and said, this is something you would be willing to do. And I thought, well, for a couple of years, sure, I'll what? So that's how I was introduced to Ed and Ricardo. Chris <laughs> set up the meeting and um, yeah, and it started off like it was really small potatoes, you guys. I mean, they had an assay, they were already running for dogs and cats. And um, and they were doing this earlier. They're just the first human publication came out in 2008, a, a neurologic um, case series. And um, so it was very early days. Um, I think Ed had already started talking to Bob Moziani. They were already working and Ed was already testing his patients under an IRB study. I mean, so there was very early days. We had no, we had really no idea. I mean, we started with Animal Health Market and Bartonella. Yeah. Right. Where does it go from there? Well, and so talk about that, because the life of a startup is really challenging, right? And there's lots of ups and downs. And I think particularly in the early stages of a company, there's always like an identity crisis. What are we going to do, right? Are we are we a Bartonella company? Are we an infectious disease company? Are we a tick-borne company? Are we going to do something different? Like, yep. talk about some of the struggles in that time frame and how you kind of emerge from that. Well, this is why I jumped the gun earlier, right? Because for me, with, with my you know, research management kind of brain. I came at this. The very first thing I did was go out and do a ton of research and rewrite the business plan. So I was immediately thinking, so of what they have, how do we, we, we set up a lab and a local incubator um, in North Carolina. We took the revenue stream that they were already earning for cats and dogs and got that test, you know, up, uh, stood up, validated running. Bayer Animal Health gave us a little bit of money to, to do read. So this is, you know, it was really part-time for all of us. We're just kind of moving things forward. I'm like digging into the research. And that's exactly the question that came up, Nicole, right from early on. Like I said, I got so excited after digging into PubMed because I thought this is inevitable. This is a new frontier of medicine. I remember doing a talk for, you know, a million cups at RTP Foundation where I talked about what we were doing as a new frontier of medicine. Um, you know, that, I mean, to put that in, in science terms, the germ theory of disease in the 1800s was about the role of infection causing acute disease. Today, um, microbiologists call it the new germ theory of disease, and that's the role of, of infection and chronic illness, right? And so that was the new frontier of medicine. Um, I, right from the beginning, we were like, so are we going to be a chronic disease company? Or, or like we, we were one infection, one bacteria, right? It was just Bartonella, right? Yeah. Bartonella. We just started with Bartonella. We understood the Bartonella um, um, problem set, and and Bartonella was only discovered in 1990, so it was the newest kid on the block, right? And so when I was looking at, and this is a funny part of the story, you know, when I'm teaching business startup to students, I always say, whatever company you want to start, go out and find an analog and an antelog. Find a company who does who has done it right and model after them and go find somebody who's made a lot of mistakes and don't do what they did. And so I literally went out into infectious disease and I, are you ready for this? I, this is Bartonella, right? Cat scratch disease. I went out and I was like, H. pylori, very effectively. Testing was stood up and it got mainstreamed pretty quickly. Lyme disease, I mean, the H. pylori has its own crazy uh, words and story too, but, and then Lyme disease, don't do what Lyme disease did. <laughs> Whatever the heck happened here, things got stuck, right? And it turned into Lyme wars. It was a standoff. And so those were my two models initially going in with this new kid on the block, um, you know, Bartonella and trying to figure out, you know, how do we commercialize testing and tell the story around that? 
So we started with Bardinella very quickly. I went out, I'm talking to, and I didn't get this so much from talking to the veterinarians, but when I started doing the market research and actually talking to physicians, what I figured out very quickly was that for physicians, they don't think about the world from the perspective of uh, an infection or you know a vector or whether that's a tick or an animal, right? When it's um, zoonotic and vector-borne disease, they think about it in terms of a patient shows up in my office, the patient has a bunch of symptoms. How do I figure out what's causing the symptoms, mm -hmm. right? And the body has only a few ways to express illness. So there's a lot of non-specific symptoms or a lot of symptoms that show up for a lot of different causes. And so I, when I looked at that, the very first thing I got was the, the physicians, um, med medicine is so fragmented. The physicians specialize in the, in the, in the brain, they specialize in the skin, they specialize in the heart and the liver, like in the joints. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, what medical specialty are, are we really going to be selling to? And we're dealing with an organism that causes multi-system disease. So what I knew is the doctors are like, okay, if I'm a cardiologist and I suspect infection, I wanna know, I wanna test for all the infections that could be involved, right? If I'm a rheumatologist and I think there's infective arthritis here, I want to test for all the infections that could be involved. And that's before we even really seriously were considering the role of infection in our psychiatric disease, right? Which has really come about over the last 15 years. So is that the moment that kind of pulled you out of just the Bartonella space and kind of pulled you into the broader infectious, you know, and other pathogens? Um, not initially. So we went after SBIR funding and we got the first non-HIV Bartonella research grant from the NIH ever. And we were, you know, very proud of ourselves for, for pulling that off. Um, it was, um, I don't know how to say, I don't know how to say this. Our, our research team was really focused on Bartonella and really wanted to put all of our pennies on Bartonella. It was the Lyme community, the tick-borne disease community that basically pulled us in and said, you guys are doing good science. We need good science. Please add Bartonella to your list, right? And then I'm getting involved in those doctors and the doctors kept adding other infections. Well, it reminds me of this and this and this and this. And um, and we've, we're still have never had the funding to really broadly go after all of the infections because our focus was, can we nail down our sort of prototype assay, the model of how we want to develop diagnostics for these different infections. I'm happy to say we're there now mm -hmm. with, you know, some with technologies we can apply very broadly, but it took us a long time to get to the place where where we with good confidence with publications um, felt like we had the tools that would really, really be useful clinically. So it's funny that the one assay that you said, don't do that, you end up getting pulled into that market. <laughs> to go along for the ride. Yep. Yep. So in terms of, you know, when you say diagnostics and when you say assays, right, that can mean a lot of different approaches and a lot of different things um, in terms of the, the technical approach that you say. And one of the things that always, that, that frankly got me interested in Galaxy was that kind of um, focus on the science and, and looking not only at the quality of the assay, but also just how it impacts clinicians on a clinical basis in terms of making their diagnosis. So talk a little bit about the different types of assays and, and what Galaxy's focused and differentiator is. Right. So I, I'm going to kind of put this in the context of recent history. Um, you know, I think everyone got a crash course in infectious disease diagnostics through COVID. And if you remember when the FDA first came out and said antibody testing bad, not a good way to confirm infection, you have to do PCR antigen testing, right? So why is it that vector-borne disease is really, really stuck on, uh, on antibody testing? And the answer is because a lot of the pathogens involved in this area of medicine are, are low abundance or stealth pathogens. They hide uh, in cell, they're often intracellular or they hide in tissue. And so standard PCR testing has never been sort of a standard of care because it has very low sensitivity compared to antibody testing, right? But the antibodies represent your immune response against the infection. So one with stealth infections, they hide so quickly, maybe there aren't antibodies, detectable antibodies. And two, when there are antibodies, they're only clinically useful in certain ways mm -hmm. at certain times, right? 
So if it's the first time you've ever gotten the infection, um, antibodies are useful, but antibodies persist for shorter or longer times, depending on the infection, right? So some can persist up to two years. So if you find, uh, if you have a patient who has had infection a long time ago, or has a repeat infection, those antibodies might not be instructive unless the titers are high or, you know, you've got an indication there. Um, if you have vaccination, you expect to see antibodies, right? Um, treatment failure. So if you diagnose a patient and you treat, especially for bacteria, you treat them for bacteria and then they come back and they're still sick. Is antibody testing very useful at that point? And not necessarily, but antibody testing can be very useful as a surrogate marker in some instances in infectious disease to follow treatment response. Like they tend to go up initially with antibiotic treatment for bacteria and then down, they'll decline later. So that can be useful. But I don't think a lot of the, like, I don't think we have those conversations. I don't think even a lot of clinicians understand the, the value of uh, or the cautions associated with antibody testing. Long story short is the limitations are extensive and it, and it causes false positive and false negative um, rates. I'd say in vector-borne disease, the false negative um, problem is the bigger problem. Um, and then I will say that when it comes to direct detection, we absolutely want um, DNA, we want antigen detection, um, which is also tends to be proteomics would be the term to describe that. Um, and I would say the added complexity that we have for Bartonella, and we're coming to see that there may be the same problem with Borrelia. And that is um, in study after study at NC State, at the Bartonella studies, we find that symptomatic individuals either have titers or have DNA, mm. right? And there's very little overlap. So what, what, clinically, what's going on there? It, does that mean, and we know, for example, with cat scratch disease, patients can have very like astronomically high titers. That's a clear indication that the and that there's current infection. But what about when you have no or low titers, but you have DNA in the, in the blood and you have symptoms? And so there's a lot of complexity around that. At this point in time, you know, our medical experts are like, you need to maximize your diagnostic data. You need to look for antibodies and DNA. If you look for one or the other, you might miss a patient. Um, um, and then the other piece of that, I would say, is that there are a lot of teams out there who are focusing on developing like immune biomarker panels um, to look for evidence of any kind of infection that, that might be helpful. Um, and also looking at other indicators of immune function and compromise. So I think there's a lot of really good work going out there, going on out there in diagnostics. But I have to tell you all, if we can't nail the direct detection, I don't know how they're going to validate the clinical, uh, you know, clinically all of these other more sophisticated. We're not going to have a really good way to define that patient population where we can establish good clinical utility for. And so that's the piece that we chose to focus on is we're, we, we need to do the really foundational work. What differentiates the way we're approaching this is that we, all of our methods are um, really focused on the pathobiology of the organism. So why do we have, uh, you know, Bartonella um, digital EPCR has a, an enrichment step where we're, where you might take a tube of blood um, out of a patient, you might only have one or two copies of the bacteria in there. So what we do is we put it into an ideal growth environment, um, our BAPDM media, and we grow up the number of bacteria. So when we take a little bit out to DNA tests, we're much more likely to get a positive, right? Um, so that's an idea. The concept there is sample enrichment. What can we do to enrich the sample to increase the odds of, of documenting DNA or antigen in a sample? Um, we're using digital PCR right now because looking for microbial DNA and host samples is like looking for a needle in a haystack. The hay gets in the way, it creates a lot of noise. And so, you know, and Nicole, I know you chuckle when I tell the story, but it's uh, with, uh, you know, digital PCR, we take that haystack, we spread it across the, um, the field and we go all archaeology on it. We look, we break it into 10 to 20,000 droplets and we look in each droplet and we're, we can increase sensitivity six to 10 times for the DNA confirma confirmation piece of that. And then with our Lyme urine test, why urine? Yeah. Well, that's because the Borrelia isn't in the blood. 
or, you know, some relapsing fever beryllium might be in the blood, but in low abundance, but beryllium dwarfi tends to be in tissue. But we do know from animal models, um, mouse models, for example, that beryllia tend to aggregate in the bladder. So in chronic infection, you can find it and they're throwing off surface proteins. So there's an opportunity to apply proteomics to do antigen testing in urine. But the antigen tends to be there in low abundance. So again, we need a sample enrichment method. And that's where the George Mason team that developed the Lyme nanotrap test that we run um, developed the nanotrap particles to capture and concentrate. And then you're testing the concentrate. So you're, you're much more likely to um, see a positive result. So sample enrichment you know, going beyond the limits of detection is what we say, but where it's sample enrichment and what can you do to the, to the sample um, to increase sensitivity, but are you also testing the right type of uh, matrix? Of, of well, specimen? And I think that's, that's key because, you know, you talk about the microbiology and understanding where you should look for the pathogen, right? Because they are stealth pathogens, they are elusive. And so, you know, you have to make sure that you're looking in the right place and that you're using the right methods. And so, Rich, it looks like you so got quickly, I, 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 I'm going to ask you to both to walk it back a little bit yep. because this, this is fascinating. I've loved the very high level conversation you're having, but I, I think I want to remind the two of you that the folks who listen to this podcast come to us from different at different places in their journey. We have some people who are brand new to this journey uh, who are just recently diagnosed. We have some people who are wondering whether or not they do in fact have Lyme disease. And then we have some folks who are much later in the journey and are familiar with a lot of the language that you're using. So Nicole, you did a brilliant job of the video you did for Lyme Warrior defining the different types of testing um, that's available. So can can you, Nicole, just, just give us uh, at a high level the, the three different types of testing first so that we can dig into that in a little bit more detail. Then I'm going to ask you to define terms like antigen and titer and some of those kinds of terms that you were using that I think some of the newer people to this community may not be familiar with. Yeah, so I think we talked about the different types of testing. So the first one that uh, Amanda mentioned is antibody testing, right? So this is not actually looking for the pathogen itself it's looking for your immune response to the pathogen or what it does is it you know puts together these little flags that will latch on to the pathogen that's kind of a little warning you know a notification to your immune system that this is a bad guy and you want to get rid of it and so you know that part of the complexities that amanda was talking about there is is that you know everybody's immune system is different right so some people have a strong immune system and they'll develop high titers or high levels of antibodies and then other people may not have a very good response maybe because they have you know their immune system isn't as strong and so understanding also the stage of the infection matters whether you just received the infection or whether you've had it for a long time can influence the antibody levels that you have and then also just some of these pathogens are sneaky like Borrelia is one that actually spits off proteins to kind of bind your antibodies so that the immune says they get cleared from your system and so you know that they, they these pathogens develop defense mechanisms so that they don't get recognized and so antibodies are a useful thing to understand from a diagnostic perspective but they only tell you a piece of the story they tell you if your immune system is reacting to the pathogen right okay. so that's kind so of so the, the antibody time. is your immune system's response to the pathogen, right? And right. and there are a number of different problems with that that the two of you have just outlined. And that has been the standard with Lyme disease testing. We right. we are we are all familiar with the two-tier test, which is which is the ELISA or Lisa yeah. and um and the and the Western blot. So can can you discuss with us why those tests have not served the community well. And one of the things that Dr. Elam talked a little bit about were false negatives. Why is it more likely that we're going to get false negatives when we're using the two-tier test that have been the standard in Lyme disease testing and why we should be moving to other, other types of tests? Well, so that now we're talking about Lyme disease or Lyme borreliosis, right? Well, I, I want to talk about, you know, the, again, I, I, and, and just so that, you know, we're, we're using I common terms. It. Yeah, because there's a, there's a different, there are different types of antibody testing too, Rich. Because can, can we make this more complicated? <laughs> well, yeah. So, so, but you know, I, I and so and one of the things I want to encourage our folks to do while they're listening to this podcast is go to Lime Warrior and 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 download the 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 really really great. Uh, it's 19 minutes, I think, Nicole. Uh, 19, uh, 19 minute video that Nicole did on this topic, so that you can get some more detail on it. Uh, it it's really 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 well done. Matt and I really enjoyed watching. Watching Nicole's work on that. 
Uh, but I, I do think for the purposes of, of folks understanding where we are, we have to sort of build this out a little bit. So it, uh, I mean, if you can just give us a, a little more detail on, on that. And and by the way, j just so that you understand the way we define Lyme disease here at Take Boot Camp is that it's a polymicrobial, multi-systemic, chronic infectious disease. That's how we define Lyme disease. So I, I'd like you to, if you would adopt that definition for the purposes yeah. of your conversation um, on, on the testing topic. Right. So when we're talking about antibody testing, I think the history is really important in the context of infectious disease, right? And antibody testing is the least expensive, quickest test that you can do. Um, and so it's used heavily in disease surveillance studies. And that's so so often infectious disease, the very first tests that we have that are broadly available and affordable um, really are these antibody testing. Um, so it, these tests have not served as well in the context of, you know, of Lyme plus, right, or tick-borne disease more generally, um, largely because a number of these pathogens are not your typical infection. They don't, they don't infect the way most people, like they're not necessarily in the blood, they're not in the blood long enough for the body to recognize them, or they, they multiply, they grow very slowly, the populations grow very slowly. So it can be uh, from the point of transmission or ac acquisition when you get the infection to when you actually develop symptoms can be weeks, sometimes months, sometimes, you know, your reaction is so mild. This goes to the point that people's different immune systems, some people will launch a vigorous response. Other people will feel kind of crappy for an afternoon. And, you know, and then later on, you have a more severe, a severe kind of presentation, right? And so that's the concept of the stealth pathogen. They kind of fly under the radar. They can evade immune response, which makes those tests not very, antibody testing not very useful. Um, and so, so, you know, do you have detectable antibodies um, in your blood? I would say the organisms, again, the pathobiology of the pathogens, um, they will um, generate or hide in biofilms. Lyme disease is well established that it creates biofilms in the blood. And so your body can't recognize something that's behind an invisibility cloak, right? Um, they're often intracellular. So Rickettsia and Bartonella, for example, um, hide inside cells. Babesia infects the erythrocytes and hides inside cells where the immune system can't see. So those antibody testings have limited utility clinically for stealth infections. It doesn't mean it isn't worth trying, like testing to see if you get a result, but if you get a negative and infectious, this is true in infectious disease generally, whether you're looking for DNA, antigen, or antibodies, but if you get a negative, a negative doesn't say the patient doesn't have the infection. And a, a negative just says the lab didn't find what they were looking for in the patient sample. And that's why an infectious disease broadly, serial testing is very common. Right. Your, your doctor will retest you periodically, you know, um, so so that's part of it. The other part of the controversy around antibody testing, and this is true across different antibody testing modalities, and that is that there are different ways to establish the right cutoff. Right. And there are pros and cons behind, you know, setting it low or setting it high. And we've seen, you know, labs, for example, who choose a lower cutoff than the CDC's recommended. And when you're saying cutoff, you're talking about the number of bands. The number of bands or in the in the cons in the in immunofluorescence or IFA assays for Bartonella and Rickettsia, for example. Here we're talking about titers, right? There's a ratio. Are you cutting it off at one to sixty-four, one to two fifty-six? You know, where where's your Where's your cutoff for this means that um, there's an infection active? And not to take this too far left, but um, you know, unfortunately, there's the the politicization of where the bands are going to be cut off and why they're going to be cut off, where they're going to be cut off with some of the some of the uh, you know the general. Right. And this and you know and I'm, now I'm getting exciting. And this goes to research design, you guys. So the bulk of the research that has been done on Lyme disease has focused on patients who had the bullseye rash, right? right. Which we know different estimates range from 10 to 30% of, of acute infections involve a bullseye, a, a confirmed bullseye um, rash. And, um, and that's a problem. What's unique about those patients that they present with that rash? 
because we know people get infected and never present with a rash. Never mind the issues around skin color and and size and cutoffs, right? Um, it's it's a really it's a really big problem um, for really understanding what what might be unique. And so all of the science is established behind a sort of a tight population that may not be representative of all of all immune systems out there of all people. And so that's contributed to the the cutoffs and definitions where those assays it's basically you know based on the sample um and it's statistical typically right it's where you have the highest confidence that this is a true positive and not a false negative and so um so what we what do we call those edge, edge conditions so some people are going to be missed wherever wherever you put it or some people are going to be overcounted depending on how you um and so if we really understand it in simplistic terms, regulators and guideline writers, medical experts are more concerned about overdiagnosis, right? And in the context of infectious disease, they're worried about overprescription of antibiotics, they're worried about the side effects of antibiotics, especially long-term courses and the other problems or conditions that can contribute to in people. Um, superbugs, like no one wants to grow a superbug in their body by taking too many antibiotics. Um, you know, gut dysfunction, that kind of thing. Meanwhile, the patients and the physicians and the, and the advocates out there, their big concern is false negatives. Because if you misdiagnose, underdiagnose an infection, what that means is that you're adding people to the chronic illness role every year. And early detection means more effective treatment. So if you are, are, are tolerating a high false negative and people are not being treated, they're at risk for Lyme arthritis, Lyme carditis, um, neuroborreliosis, some of the really severe uh, outcomes that that can result. Um, and that same goes for, you know, Bartonellosis and some of these other infections that cause multi-system disease. Okay, so we, Nicole, we've now discussed, uh, we've now discussed the antibody testing and holy cow, are there many, many problems with that? And you guys have done a great job of taking that apart. So now let's talk about the second method of testing. So the, the next two categories would be in what I would categorize as direct detection, right? So this is where your, you know, antibodies, as we said, is an immune response to the pathogen, not the pathogen itself. Direct detection is actually looking for markers that indicate the pathogen is there, right? So, and there's two types of that. One would be kind of DNA, uh, you know, or, uh, DNA-based technology or RNA, you're looking for the nucleic acid of the actual pathogen itself. So this is like PCR, going back to the COVID analogy, right? This is, I go and I get a PCR test and it says whether or not I have an active COVID infection. And this is, um, this is one of the ways that you can directly detect the pathogen. Now, another way is antigen testing. So this is a little bit different in that this is, you know, proteins or other molecules that the pathogen spits off. They're unique and specific to the pathogen, but it's not the actual DNA. So it's actually proteins or molecules that you're, you're looking for. And so those are kind of direct detection methodologies. And as Amanda mentioned earlier, you can look for those, you can use those different methods in different types of samples. So you can do both of those methods in blood or serum, or you can also look in something antigen detection is also could be in urine, for example, which lots of antigens would get spit off. You can do um, also DNA detection. So it really just depends on what the microbiology of the pathogen is and what the best method for detection of that organism is. And, and, I'll, and I'll throw another stick in the gears if you want. Please. <laughs> some, of the method, some of the messiness of antigen testing is that they we're usually going after surface proteins, like the spike proteins for COVID, the spike protein for COVID kind of thing. Um, we're going for surface antigens. Now, one of the things that makes Borrelia such a, an interesting organism is that it can it varies its surface proteins and, and as and Nicole mentioned, can throw them off to, to keep the, antib the antibodies busy, right? And so, um, and so this is this is challenging because organisms also share surface proteins. So there are non-specific antigens um, that are indicators of infection. So this is where you go. You look at your Lyme Western blot, and originally when that Western blot was created, it was thought that most of those bands were specific to Borrelia. And over the de over a couple of decades, we've learned that a lot of them are non-specific. And so, you know, you think about band 41, for example, that seems to be positive for everybody. Well, that's for flagella, the, the little, you know, 
the, the little strands that the organisms use for motility and a lot of organisms have that and remember we have more bacteria in our in our bodies than we even have our, some of our own um, our own cells right and so there are lots of organisms pathogenic and non pathogenic commensal who can have share surface proteins with the pathogens and that's and that so our antibodies can react against surface proteins um, that might not be specific to the organism and we may pick up antigens we have to be very careful with our antigen tar targets to make sure they're highly specific to the target organism um, otherwise you know we're we're not detecting what we think we're detecting and and that's where the science gets into the validation and the accuracy and there's scientists love to debate all of these things and and some organisms change the surface proteins from from the ones that they present with when at the beginning of infection to later especially chronic infection for example antibody testing tends to become more cross-reactive um, when you've lived with an organism in your body for a long time and like we know that <laughs> we know that IgM the first antibodies the body creates are very non-specific because because they're they're broad um, and they could be dumb. So we see a lot of people with IgM positive, um, you know, Western blots or ELISA's and Lyme, and and the answer is it might indicate a completely different infection. Um, so so there's all this complexity to the every lab test has limitations, right? And even PCR isn't perfect. So so let's talk a little bit more about PCR uh, because when we interview Dr. Alan McDonald, who's uh, one of our one of our favorite people. Nicole's not the only person we love. Uh, Dr. McDonald is another person that we really, really admire. Um, and he actually had argued that Lyme is a really dirty bug. And he actually sent us uh, some images that uh, that he had um, that he had located or or or, or um, he was able to create. And and so he had a, we had a, we ended up on our, our Instagram it was a blue image and it had the Lyme bacteria and it, it was spitting off all this stuff. Right. And I, I, at the time I thought, wow, well, you know, I mean, this direct detection testing would be great. But then we interviewed Dr. Ava Shapi. And one of the things Dr. Ava Shapi shared with us is that when, when the, when these bugs are all creating their colonies and they're, and they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they begin to exchange proteins, right? So the surface protein of the Borrelia before it gets into, you know, this colony where, where, you know, you, you were calling it the invisibility cloak, um, you know, they then exchange, they then exchange protein. So, you know, my question to the two of you is, um, is direct detection, um, you know, the, the best method, or is it better than this indirect detection when we have these bugs exchanging surface proteins? And do we really know what we're finding when we have not just the bugs that are being spit into us by the ticks that are biting us or, you know, whatever other vectors are putting things into us, but then they're then combining with the other microbes that we're managing in our body. And they're then getting, uh, you know, they're then getting into this, this process of shape shifting and, and, and exchanging uh, surface proteins. Well, they, they can share DNA too. Um, and so it, and the answer is it, it comes down to, are you picking the right targets? Mm -hmm. Right. And DNA is, uh, the dream or RNA is that are the dream targets because you can establish a high level specificity through sequencing so that you can get a sequence confirmation and be really sure that what, what you detected is, is what you were targeting. Um, and that's specificity, right? Your specificity can be really high. It's a little messier with antigen testing. Um, and that's where, you know, like with the multiple bands strategy, um, you know, there's there's uh, higher confidence if you can detect multiple specific proteins. Um, and proteomics will have, you'll have panels that are designed to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and we don't have a way to confirm specificity with antibodies the way we can do that with direct detection, yeah. right? So we, we, we can, this is all about confidence. It's all about probability in the, in the science around the design of the assays. Well, and I would say that the other thing that's really important in the way that Galaxy approaches 
the problem is, is really doing the research and doing the patient studies in order to understand how these assays are performing in a clinical environment. I mean, the research publications that they have, you know, through Galaxy Research Partners is really, I think, what sets them apart in trying to really understand, do we have the right targets? Do we have the right assay? Are we looking in the right places? Because, um, that's the key is what's going to give you that clinical answer at the end of the day and are you giving the patient that right answer right, right? And, and doing those research studies and i think that foundation and research that amanda has from her background as well as you know ed and, and dr maji from you know their work at nc state that's been the core of the company from the very beginning right it's like our values right science <laughs> integrity and transparency and publication for us is really key um, and we're, we're very concerned about teams that are developing assays out there that aren't publishing and aren't being transparent about the, you know, if they're using recombinant proteins or how they're designing their assay. If it goes against the grain or if it's novel in a way where, you know, uh, the scientific experts don't even understand what it is that they're doing, it's really important that those labs publish and, and make it plain. Um, and, and that's something we felt strongly about from the beginning. So... You know, we've sought scientific consensus around the design of our assays, around the findings that we're doing. We also understand that every study we publish isn't, you know, some sort of significant milestone. It takes multiple studies to build the confidence of the medical experts and scientific community um, out there. And I think that publication strategy has really, again, been guided by those values of, you know, science integrity and, and transparency we we're, we're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes out here um we we really want to work with the best minds to um, develop these solutions so why don't you talk a little bit more about the importance of the relationship between the research community and the clinical community right because mm -hmm. that's one of the things we debate about a lot on this on this podcast because a lot of our folks are troubled by doctors either having concerns about treating people with Lyme disease or taking a very limited approach to the way they will treat people with Lyme disease. And the argument that, you know, we've tried to make to folks in the community is that's really not the a challenge created by doctors. Doctors really want to define what's wrong with you and they really want to help you to get better. It's really the limitations placed on doctors by uh, by the education departments or the licensing uh, right. community, which is only going to allow you to use, and get, I guess on some level, the legal community, because we sue doctors who step outside of using the generally accepted medical practices when, when someone gets hurt, uh, when they step outside of those practices, right? So I, I think it's important for our community to understand what the two of you are talking about and the importance of what you're doing, right? Because the only way that doctors are going to be comfortable with using the testing, the most advanced testing, is if the advanced testing is supported by research. And if it's supported by research and, um, and, and, and it's generally accepted by the medical community, then doctors are going to feel comfortable using these tests. Whereas if your doctor, if you're encouraging your doctor to use tests from a laboratory that is not publishing the results of the research they're doing and the assays they're using, then it's less likely that the doctor is going to be willing to use that test. And if the doctor is not going to be willing to use that test, they're going to fall back to the old testing, which you've already defined as failed testing. So it's not, you know, it's wonderful, Dr. Elam, that your company and, and Nicole, because you're working there now as well, it's wonderful that your company is doing the, you know, essentially taking an open source approach to sharing your research. But I think more important from a patient standpoint, that we want to know that our doctors are going to feel confident with using the testing that you're offering because it's going to be supported by the research, not only from your co-founders who are people who are working at NCA, uh, NC State and, and doing the research in real time, but because it, it, is, it is being supported by generally accepted medical practices, which would then allow doctors to safely use these tests. Well, I would say generally accepted research practices. Okay. I, think there's a, I actually think there's a big disconnect between the research community and the clinicians who are practicing out there. I think it's contributed to a lot of the controversy. So, for example, in you know, in the lab research world and diagnostics research world, I think there are a lot of researchers out there who need to spend more time talking to doctors because they don't realize that that lab testing is one set of tools that doctors use in the diagnostic process, right? And ultimately, these infections, the diagnosis is, is a clinical diagnosis. It's up to the doctor's discretion. So that's one piece of it. 
I would say on the doctor side of things, testing has gotten so complex that a lot of doctors never learned how these methods worked in medicine. Um, I hope when they go out and they're they're selecting lab partners that they're looking for the publication that they're looking you know, for for really good credibility behind the assays. I mean, there are a lot of standard assays that labs can offer and they're so well established, you wouldn't question it too much. But but I would want to know who the lab director is. I'd want to see some evidence that they're working with the scientific community, um, you know, and um, and and, you know, I think that's learning how to navigate innovation it can be very very challenging for people who don't have a lot of training in the complexity of what we're doing these days well, Dr. Let's, let's build that piece out as well because um you know we did interview uh one of your co-founders dr brightwart and one of the things that i really admired about him is not only is he a researcher he's also a clinician and he's kept his hands in the in the clinical world right so one of the really i think powerful elements that your lab brings to the community that is not brought to the community by many other labs is one of the co-founders is a clinician and he continues to work in the clinical arena so that he's not only doing the research and you're not only relying on the research that you're doing, but you're also watching how this is behaving in the field. And I think that's an important element that folks need to Rich, know about when considering a lab. Rich, I think there's even more magic to what Dr. Brightsford and Dr. Maggi are doing at the College of Veterinary Medicine. They study zoonotic vector-borne diseases. These are infections shared between animals and people. And they study these infections across multiple species of animal. And, and in human medicine, our researchers and doctors are only focusing on one, on one species. And so the patterns that emerge. So for example, and, and Dr. Brachford, if he didn't say this in the interview, he says this all the time, that the dogs actually are an incredibly powerful model um, for infectious disease in people because we co-evolved with these animals we've shared so much you know even our diets are similar right i mean we just it's um it's these infections tend to play out in similar ways in uh in our bodies as well as in dogs bodies and so i think that that comparative medicine perspective is incredibly powerful and i think it's particularly important in the context of um, vector-borne disease and these stealth pathogens because it's very difficult for us to um, meet the Koch postulates, you know, sort of set of postulates that kind of are, are how you establish proof that an infection causes disease. It's very difficult to do that when you're dealing with stealth pathogens. Dr. Brightshort published a paper on this um, that, I, that I think is really important, but he said, you know, another, another postulate is if uh, an infection causes similar disease processes across multiple species of animal, you should feel pretty confident that there's disease causation going <laughs> on. Right. So, so, and I think you're bringing up another point, and, and, and we've really tried to focus on the entire disease pattern here at Take Boot Camp more recently. Early on in our, in our development, what we were largely doing is interviewing patients and medical doctors, right? And then we, then we realized that we weren't capturing the entire spectrum of this disease. And we were looking through a very limited prism. That would be the human response to the microbes, right? But what's happening is, we have microbes that are that are in an animal, some animal, right? And those microbes are changing within that animal. Then we're then we have some vector that is taking the the microbes from the animal and then ultimately spitting them into us. And then we have our reaction to it. So if we're not looking at each piece of this, and again, your lab is doing it brilliantly. I really love the way you formed your team together and 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 having the full spectrum of folks who understand microbiology, understand the 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 impact that um, that this disease which is going from animal to humans the, so studying the animal model as well then the vector then the human right you need that whole spectrum in and, and quite frankly i don't know if there's another lab that has the team that your lab has um uh, that that has that whole spectrum and is looking at that whole spectrum in a research arena with generally accepted i'll, I'll use your term dr Lim, research standards um I, I think that's an important part of your story that that I'm happy that we're talking about and that folks can, you know, can hear through this podcast and the podcast that we did with one of your co-founders. Yeah, I, I really think that we took a very broad approach to this, looking at, uh, you know, the intersection. It's, there's an international movement called One Health, right? So it's the it's disease and medicine, you know, health and medicine at the intersection of animal, human, and environmental health. 
-hmm. And I, I mean, honestly, can you think of a better poster child for that than tick-borne disease? I mean, you know, we're living it. It's, it's there out, out, out in our environment. It's, it's in the, it affects the animals and it affects our families, um, the people in our families as well. And I think that, um, I, I'd like to think that we've taken a really good approach and that we've raised people's confidence that, you know, we know what we're doing. Um, it's just, it's, it's, you know, yeah. we, and, we, and I'd like to take add the easiest way of doing this. <laughs> yeah. Say. Well, and I'd like to add another piece kind of tying together some previous threads, but another key part of that, like looking across multiple, you know, animal models and, and humans and so forth is, is really, you know, we know these bacteria have multiple strains, right, that have different reactions. And so those clinical isolates of the different bacteria, going back to, well, how do you know that that antigen is right and that this is, you know, or this DNA probe that you're looking for is the right one is because there's access to all of these clinical isolates that tell us, so these are all the strains of Bartonella, these are all the strains of Borrelia, and then testing against them to see, okay, which ones are flagging, which ones are not, and really understanding how that works because it's an enormously complex environment. And if you get it wrong, you're gonna be cross-reacting with other species, you're gonna be cross-reacting with other things and reporting a clinical result that's really leading somebody down the wrong path. Right, and so we we operate from basic microbiology all, uh, all the way up to the high complexity methods that we're developing. And well, let's 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 build that a little bit more because that's one of the things we've talked about, Nicole, in this podcast in the past, which is with the two-tier test, which is again the standard that you'll get from LabCorp or from Quest or one of these, you know, even Stony Brook has their own little piece of it, right? Uh, what they're doing is they're testing one one bacteria and one strain of one bacteria, right? And we know, for example, with Borrelia alone, there are at least, I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, it's either 12 or 13 different strains of this bacteria. And if there's only, if we're only testing for one, how do we know whether or not somebody has just Borrelia, no less any of these other co-infections that you've, you know, so, you know, eloquently talked about? Right. And now you know why microbiology and medicine love DNA testing and sequencing, because they want that specificity and they, and they, and it is getting complicated, especially in the context of polymicrobial infection. Um, and, you know, and, and in the, the context of multiple species, um, within a genus of bacteria, um, you know, viral mutations, I mean, the keeping up with all of it, it's, it's, is it, wait, what's the most pathogenic? Could virulence vary across species? Can the pathobiology vary? Do they behave different? We know this about Borrelia, right? The relapsing fever Borrelia has behaved quite differently in the body than Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of concerns. Um, you know, we, for our PCR testing, we tend to go genus level um, to detect um, as we look at, you know, the, the prospect of developing multiplex assays. We're also very well aware that regulators are interested in, in following what I would call a classic paradigm in infectious disease, one pathogen, one disease. And how we move beyond that is, is challenging. Amanda, maybe just give like a two minute primer on the genus versus species for people that may maybe not be as into that right, so, language. So, right. So for bacteria, um, Bartonella is a genus, right? And then we have multiple species. So Bartonella hensley, Bartonella quintana, Bartonella cholerae, Bartonella vitsone barcophi. There's actually like 40 species, about 20 of them uh, or over 20 now have been implicated in animal and human disease. Within each species, there can be strains. And so, you know, <laughs> right. the, all the uh, phylogenetics, the phylogeny of, of, of how all of this um, works is very complex. In Bartonella genus, for example, um, one of the sort of ancient um, uh, species is Bartonella basiliformis, which is found only in South America or is transmitted only in South America based on the science that, that we have today. It is the most virulent species of Bartonella. And for if you didn't grow up as an indigenous person in the Andes of Peru um, or Chile, then you probably would die very quickly from infection, right? Okay, or so higher let, risk of death. Let's define virulent as well. Uh, we, we, we have spent a lot of time talking about this with Dr. Rawls, for example, and we interviewed mm -hmm. him and he has his virulence triangle. So let's talk about that and why that's significant to, uh, to both testing and response. 
Right. Severalist basically means what threat does it pose to the host? How how severe disease can can it uh, um, can it cause, or how severe, or vigorous, an immune reaction? And that's the other principle in infectious diseases. It's usually host response that causes the disease, not necessarily the presence of the pathogen. And I think when we're looking at these stealth infections, that's one way to understand virulence. Low virulence means that asymptomatic infection is probably quite common. Whereas high virulence means that when you become infected, your your body launches a vigorous uh, immune response to to try to clear out the invader as quickly as possible, and that's what causes the the severe disease or the severe response. And we know that it's not just the virulence of the pathogen; it can also be variability in uh, immune function. Some people have like hyper immune responses, and other people seem to not react to everything that comes across their immune system's radar. So now let's let's walk this down to uh, to achievement and the things that you've achieved at um, at your lab. And let's give folks an outline because we've talked on you know very broadly about the process. And this has been really a, a great podcast so far. I'm really enjoying uh, geeking out with the two of you. But let's now talk about let's talk about what it is that you offer at um, uh, at Galaxy because you've talked about urine testing, you've talked about blood testing, and we've we've sort of touched on it very generally. So why don't you why don't you outline for us? Um, Lucky Lim, what type of urine testing you have and why urine testing is 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 a is a good tool. Talk to us about what blood testing you offer. Um, talk to us about what other types of testing, if there is other type of testing other than blood and urine. And the other thing I'd like you to discuss while you're while you're outlining the specific tests that folks could can, can seek from your lab is um, whether or not there are any steps someone can take before they're giving you a sample that makes it more likely that you'll be able to find pathogens that might be stealth pathogens and maybe hiding in parts of their body. Right. So we call that provocation, right? Um, there isn't a lot of data behind provocation, but um, doctors report, um, you know, that's that having a massage or exercising um, can sort of push uh, intracellular bacteria out into the circulation. And that could get flushed into, you know, your your bladder and and throughout your digestive system. So um, there's also, you know, antibiotics and steroids are sometimes used to profit uh, for provocation as well. Um, again, I'm just going to say there isn't a lot of research data in our area of medicine around this, but these are principles that have been used in uh, in clinical practice in the past to um, to to. Uh, uh, influence test results. Um, so in terms of what we're offering right now, um, we have basically, I would say, uh, two key offerings, novel offerings that um, based on the research studies so in well-defined populations seem to perform well or high-risk populations seem to perform um, better for direct detection. And so the Lyme Borrelia uh, urine um, nanotrap test is, uh, I mean, a lot of people love this test because you can do home collection, right? There's no needle sticks. It's really easy to collect. Um, and that uses basically the hydrogel nanoparticles to capture and concentrate um, the OSP-A protein in urine. And then we confirm the presence um, of that uh, antigen using, um, sort of a, a Western blot technique, right? Proteo a proteomics technique, basically, to confirm the presence. And then, um, and so that's our offering right now for Lyme Borrelia. And then we have uh, direct detection. And then we have um, the DNA testing we're doing for Bartonella using the BAPGM media. So this is a proprietary growth media, Bartonella Alpha Proteo growth medium. It was really designed to map the digestive system over flea or tick, which is where these organisms are usually really happy. And we use that media to grow up any bacteria that might be in blood, full blood. Um, and then before we aliquot out for testing, and then we're using DDPCR, a more sensitive PCR method, right, to confirm the presence of the organism after one week of culture and incubation. Um, and so those are our two novel direct detection assays. We have insurance reimbursements, so we have codes behind them, and we're working with insurance companies to to um, on the reimbursements and um, 
And then whenever you develop or launch novel assays, you have to have the reference assays, right? The standard of care assays. So we have IFA serology is a standard of care for Bartonella. And we have, of course, the two-tier testing um, on Lyme disease. And we actually recommend that, that clinicians order both, right? Especially at baseline, when you've got a new patient, new diagnosed, or order both, see what's there. Um, serology can be useful to monitor treatment response. Um, and then we also have, you know, a, a basic set of PCRs for all the pathogens were sort of aspirational um, in the tick-borne disease space that, that we're going to build out. So, so those pathogens will be the next set that we're applying these, these novel techniques to um, as we uh, move forward. And, and yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, one of the things that people will see when they go to look at the Bartonella assay in particular is the triple draw. Describe a little bit the why the triple draw and what that is. Great. So um trying to make this a little bit more accessible for the lay audience. Please. <laughs> right. So I like to use the military supply run. So Bartonella infects the bloodstream, it hides in the cells that lie in the vascular system, and it cycles in and out of the blood, right? And it can infect the red blood cells, but it cycles in and out of the blood. We don't, it's on an approximate five to seven day cycle. So we did the triple draw because we figure if the enemy is running us doing a supply run once a week and we send out three patrols, we're much more likely to find the enemy than if we only test once. <laughs> and so it's a it's basically a form of serial testing, but we collect samples Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and that um, based on uh, published published research, pretty much doubles the likelihood of finding uh, of, of finding a, a positive result. So now. If folks wanted to work with your lab, can they work with you directly? Meaning, can they order a test kit from you and take the urine test and go to a, a traditional lab and have the blood drawn? Or do they have to work through a, a clinician? They have to work through a clinician. And this is something that we have spent a lot of time thinking very carefully about. We are emerging infectious disease. The clinical picture is not very clear. Um, and so it's re we think it's really important for patients to work with clinicians because the disease processes, these multi-system disease processes are highly complex. And again, one of the things that sets our team apart is that we have published case report after case report, right? Where we've documented the DNA um, in a patient and described clinically what's happening. I followed those cases beyond the case report and they're messy. There can be a lot of things going on. So we really, we require a doctor's order um, for testing. Now, can doctors in every state order labs from your lab? And I ask that question because I'm a New Yorker. Right. And, and we, we've had labs who we've interviewed in the past tell us that, uh, that yeah. New York has different standards in other states. Mm -hmm. And they seem, to have, they seem to have gatekeepers that are preventing some of the uh, some of the specialty labs from offering services to citizens in this state. Right, right. Um, so New York State has uh, requires out of state licensing. So for any lab outside the state selling to, you know, in the state, um, you have to have a special license and the standards associated with that are um, quite rigorous. It's considered a bit of a, a gold standard. Um, we haven't gone um, through NC State licensing yet. We've attempted a couple of times. Our major limitation really is their lab director. Our lab director works for North Carolina Public Health and she, you know, oversees two labs and we're number three and NC and New York limits the lab director to two oversight. We'd have to go find another lab director in order to pursue that. And so again, we've tried a couple of times over the years. The latest time was COVID and our that we had a lab director in training and that got disrupted for obvious reasons. So we'll try again, but it's available everywhere else. California and uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland also require um, state licensing. It's just that they're really more of a registration process, um, whereas New York actually comes in the Spectre lab and does something totally independent and super expensive. Um, so we'll get there. Okay, well, we're, we're hoping you can do that. I know folks are going to be excited about, uh, you know, having more testing options. Talk to us about one more thing before we talk about your transformation, because I, I think this has just been really cool. Um, and, and, and I'm really excited to talk to you about how you went from where you were to where you are now and how, you know, looking backward, I could see how you've ended up where you are. But let's pause on that for a second. Um, 
And, and, and lot, let's talk a little bit about multiple testing, right? You talked about the Bartonella test where you have the multiple drawers, right? But we, you, you did earlier reference the importance of, of essentially um, testing often so that you can get a better result, right? So um, I, I think it's important for folks in the community to understand that a test is just a data point. And the more tests you take, the more data points you will have, and the more data points you have, the more likely it is you'll be able to get an understanding of what the full spectrum is of the infectious element of your chronic disease. So you can talk to us about um, multiple testing and and how that can um, how that can result in a better outcome for uh, folks in the chronic Lyme disease community. Right. Well, I think what you might be referring to serial testing, which again is usually up to the clinician if they have a high the clinician has a high clinical suspicion that um, an infection is involved, they will often recommend serial testing. Like, I'd like to test you again and, and again and see how things are going. They certainly do that with antibody testing all the time to see how the, the bands or the titers are, are changing over time. And some clinicians have found very useful approaches that have helped them take care of patients. Um, I would say more than anything, what I'm seeing and we're aspirational in applying our technologies broadly is I think polymicrobial testing is probably even more important, right? Testing for all the pathogens. And, and this goes back to what we talked to at the beginning, like when we couldn't figure out, are we a Bartonella company? Are we flea and tick-borne disease company? Are we going to be a chronic disease company? And I think ultimately our aspirations are chronic disease and we want to build out panels that really are helpful to clinicians. Like I have a patient with polyarthritis and I think an infection could be involved because they had all these risk factors. What do I order? And it's like, can we create something easy for them to order that will that will look for everything from a direct detection perspective? So but what, what, one of the other questions I wanted you to address for me is, um, is using testing to determine how you should be treated over time, right? Because the 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 metaphor that many people in the Lyme community use is that Lyme is like an onion. And you take away one level of the onion and you find yourself with another level of the onion, right? So for example, uh, folks are using, you know, double dapsone or triple dapsone, and it seems like that beats down the Borrelia, but now all of a sudden the Bart comes out, right? And now we deal with that. And now, and, you know, and we just sort of, we have these, new microbes that are surfacing at different times as we're going on the treatment journey. So yeah, we have a polymicrobial infection, right. um, certainly need polymicrobial testing, but I think layering our testing also helps us with determining how to progress with our treatment. What, what are right. your thoughts on that, Dr. Ewan? So my thoughts on that, actually, I'm going to go right back to uh, meetings I, uh, I attended in DC at the end of June, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine held a workshop on the role of an uh, infection in chronic illness so, or infection associated chronic illness. And one of the themes that came out of that conference was the desperate need for surrogate testing, surrogate measures. So right now doctors are, are relying to some degree on antibody testing, right? To see how to monitor treatment response. Um, but there are teams out there who are um, trying to develop sort of like um, uh, immune biomarker panels that can be used that have a mix of specific, non-specific types of measures that might be more useful for monitoring treatment response. Um, I, we are years away from having something, you know, game-changing, um, but the work's happening, and I'm very excited about that. In the meantime, I think most people are going to find their doctors are going to want to do serial testing, primarily with antibody testing, just to see what changes. Right. You know, do the levels go up? Do the levels go down? You know, are you seeing new proteins or proteins disappearing or, or what's happening? Um, I know some doctors are actually use other immune, uh, uh, immune um, testing as well. Um, I think that's an underdeveloped area um, of research, but um, I've known, for example, some doctors who've worked in the HIV population have uh, more rigorous immune profiling they do for their patients, and, and they, they monitor to see how those uh, immune measures um, change as the patient recovers from infection. So now let's, let's take this home now and talk about how this has been transformational for you. The gal who went to NC State, I'm sorry, uh, UNC, I, I don't want to mess that one up. 
uh, went to uh, UNC and grad and 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 studied as an undergraduate international studies. And you're now at the forefront of of working in an arena that has become an international crisis. Um, we have we have someone who has uh, spent a great deal of time uh, working in uh, women's leadership and has mentored other women. And this is a disease that is affecting women substantially differently than it's affecting men. LymeDisease.org and Lorraine Johnson from LymeDisease.org uh, had just published in, uh, in a highly respected journal uh, the varying responses uh, to this disease in the, in the female population versus the male population. So talk to us about how you seem to be the perfect person to be where you are now, in part because you studied um, uh, international studies, in part because um, you're a, a female entrepreneur, and in part because you've been mentoring women and women in business. And here you are um, now at the forefront of developing tools to help people in the midst of an international crisis that's affecting women substantially different than it's uh, affecting men. Right. I think probably my training in sociology was even more key. All right. Um, looking at, you know, health and uh, health equity and uh, and and certainly the gender studies looking at uh, the, the challenges. Uh, the female biology is substantially different from male biology. And I'll, I'll tell you, in a lot of the Bartonella case series research, some of the most compelling cases come up um, over the life course in men and women at key uh, hormonal transmissions. So we see some of the the most severe disease seems to pre present, for example, in adolescent males, so during puberty, right, and in menopausal women. And so I think there's a whole uh, story to be told around um, the stealth infections and sort of the hormonal life cycle. Um, the other thing I'll note about women is, you know, women are at higher risk for autoimmune disease or immune-mediated disease, and there's a lot of debate in um, the medical literature around why this is, right? I mean, well, we all think about immune function declines as we get older, um, but there's a lot of evidence suggesting that women actually have much stronger immune systems. But with the menstrual cycle, we also, in, in pregnancy, right, our immune function are, actually goes up and down over the course of the months. And so a lot of Lyme, female Lyme patients you'll hear talking about how their symptoms are so much worse right before they have their period. And, and I think that's probably because their immune radar are on high alert at that point, right? And then in pregnancy, our immune systems are suppressed, so we don't reject the fetus. So there's a ton of work that has to be done around female biology and infection. Um, that said, in terms of the acute Lyme disease literature, um, you know, men seem to be at higher risk for actual acquisition of the infection. Right. And that may have to do with spending more time in the outdoors or, you know, like if you're hunters or trail runners or campers or hikers, um, that that's where or, or working in occupations, you know, outdoor occupations where you have um, higher rates of, of vector exposure. Um, so I think I think for us to really pay a lot more attention to the pairing between risk factors and symptoms is incredibly important. We know the highest risk group for zoonotic vector-borne infections, again, are veterinary workers. So if veterinary workers are at higher risk because of exposure to animals and vectors, what about pet owners, right? And so, you know, and does that influence the gender story at all? Like women often are the ones taking care of the dogs and cats and the health of the dogs and cats in the household. And so, um, you know, and who's sleeping with their pets. <laughs> so I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot to be done around gender and biology. And I think there's a lot to be done around gender and social practices. All right. So let's talk about the last piece because you've been very polite, but I'm going to pull you into the controversial piece again. Because part of what part of what uh, Lorraine Johnson found in her study is that women are gaslit at a substantially higher rate than men are by doctors, right? And uh, I think if we have better testing and we have data points that would allow a doctor to to be more at peace with the clinical presentation than they are now, then it's less likely that women will be gaslit. It's less likely that they will have to have a longer diagnostic journey. It's substantially longer for women than it is for men. And it's more likely that we can catch these diseases before they become chronic in women, which is happening at a substantially higher rate than men. And I don't think it's just pure biology. 
they're, they're clearly are some biological issues, but I think it's more social. So I, I'd like you to put on your, your PhD hat and talk to us about how women are being treated differently by doctors and how more competent testing would result in less gaslighting and earlier diagnosis for women in a clinical setting. So I think that there, it, it isn't just women, it's um, people uh, with any kind of social disadvantage. Um, they they aren't taken as seriously, right? They have to ask more, they have to insist, they have to produce more evidence. Um, I think that that's um, a big part of it. I think stereotypes are part of that too. Women are seen as uh, with stronger hypochondriac tendencies. I think if women also, if you understand that whole female biology, that maybe we're experiencing more pain and discomfort, certainly there's research showing we have more pain receptors on our bodies that we're more likely to complain sooner. Um, and, and so I, I guess I see it as like a two-way street. There's also research showing that female doctors listen to their patients and that male doctors on average, again, because they're wonderful male doctors and terrible female doctors and vice versa. Um, but I think that on average, um, I, I think what you find is that men are more likely to dismiss, um, you know, people's concerns. Um, and again, their stereotypes play in. Um, I think that for people who don't come from, you know, a, a background where they have a lot of experience in the medical community, they might not be as articulate or, you know, as ready to pull out studies or explain, you know, what's going on with their daughter, or they have a harder time communicating the gut. Oh, but, you know, we, we, in most cases, if we're not going to step out of the traditional medical system, we only have 15 minutes to talk with our doctor. Yep. Uh, and when we only have 15 minutes to talk with our doctor, if the doctor doesn't have yep. a, a dashboard before him, her, or them, uh, and, and, and a dashboard only comes from good testing, yep. then, then it's easier for all of these, all of these biases to be exacerbated. But I can tell you on this podcast, at least we've interviewed a, and we've been very aggressive about making sure that we we've, we've, we've built out the entire quilt and we've made sure that we brought, we brought a diversity of voices to this community. I, I can tell you that even even the, the the people who are who are in multi um, um, uh, minority groups tell us that it's actually their gender that is actually the gender that's most salient. Yeah, I I don't know what to tell you I, to tell you about that. I think the data has to speak for it. Uh, on average, what I will say is that anybody talking to their to their doctor um, uh, about you know the chronic Lyme. Some of the the illness, some of the symptoms, and I think it's very, very difficult. And a part of that is because there's lack of training on the parts of the doctors. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure I've talked to so many uh, physicians over the years, Rich, and you know I have lots of crazy stories. Right? A doctor once said to me, "I've never heard of fleas transmitting disease," and all I could think is, "Where were you in middle school?" Yeah. Um, well, I've had doctors, you know, I've had doctors say. Um, thank God you're doing this work on cat scratch disease. I think this is so important. I've seen this in my practice, but thank God you're not in all that Lyme crazy stuff. Um, I, I mean, I mean, I, I've seen it all over the place. Um, we have, but I, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm giving you the softball. Yeah. So I'm going to let Nicole come back in. Nicole, I'm going to let you hit the softball, right? Because really, I think, I think you, you, you folks have to take more credit than, than Dr. Elam, who's very, being very humble here, right? Because I, I really think, that the gaslighting, regardless of the bias that's triggering the gaslighting, um, or the limitations and time that doctors have to spend with us when we're in the traditional setting as opposed to the concierge uh, system, it's testing, isn't it? I mean, is, isn't it the work that the two of you are doing and the rest of the folks in your lab, uh, the solution to this problem where a doctor has a dashboard in front of them and they see this is what someone has, however you create that with a polymicrobial test, or layering your testing, or or coming up with whatever solution it is that you're all working toward. Once we have that, yep. isn't that the end of the gaslighting that that's affecting the female population substantially more than it is the male population? And in my view, not just because of of biology. Yeah, I mean, I this is why when I got on the other side of my journey, I looked around and said, where can I have the most impact? Right? Where can I solve the problem? that was at the very beginning that sent us down the wrong path <clears throat> and made my journey so much harder. And it was that first stinking failed test 
that sent us down a completely different test and all sorts of nonsense other tests with neurologists that didn't do any good right it's that one piece of paper that says you have this infection or these infections in your body and that's what's causing your immune system to fail and so for me personally yes because you know i mean as you mentioned i've gone to some pretty good schools right but sitting across from a doctor who's telling you something that your gut says that's not right but you know, this is your expert and they're talking to you and they're saying, this is what's, this is the dogma, this is the thing. And you're like, oh, it's hard to push back. You know, I don't care how many degrees you have, you're sitting across from an expert, quote unquote, and it's hard to fight back, mm -hmm. you know? And I was there with my husband as a caregiver and it's hard. I wasn't even sick, I was healthy and I still struggle to have that. So that piece of paper, that was what for me, unfortunately it came 15 months after that first test that told me he was negative, but that first piece of paper that said, oh my gosh, this is what's really going on. And so to me, that's the start. There's so many other problems in Lyme disease and in tick-borne illness and Lyme plus, whatever you wanna call it, that need to be solved, you know, in treatment and advocacy and healthcare and so forth. But that first thing, the first bowling pin that needs to come down is getting the test right. Yep. And we're not there yet. And I think Galaxy, when I looked across at all the places and all the research that was out there, Galaxy to me was the one that stood out. And that's why, you know, I, I got involved and that's why I'm helping him scale the business. Yeah. Uh, let me give you one more piece, Dr. Elam, because, you know, after interview almost 400 patients um, over the course of this almost four years, the piece of paper is important for another really important um, part of this journey. And mm -hmm. that is the social support uh that patients either get or do not get from their families when they're ill right you have this you have this migrating disease that causes doctors to argue that it's all in your head which in many cases then causes family members not to believe that you're really sick and they then they they then abandon you if not physically, certainly emotionally, which then becomes immunosuppressive and it causes a disease to, to, to spiral. So, um, and, I, and I'm sure you understand this, but if you didn't understand before this, that's why these tests are so important. It's not just defining what's wrong with you from the standpoint of taking steps um, going forward with treatment and having doctors believe you, but it's also having a tool to help to keep your family supporting you and your friends supporting you. My co-host was abandoned by everyone other than his mother, his father, and his grandparents, um, and um, and also believing yourself, right? Believing mm -hmm. you're not you know you know you're, you're not crazy right so this piece of paper that you you folks are you know offering to people with your testing is so so important and yeah, I yeah it's I evidence it's evidence it's independent evidence that says this could be going on um I, I think it's incredibly important I think that um medical education is also incredibly important there are still doctors out there that you know don't know that Bartonella orb really is associated with um these different chronic diseases and so I, I look at some of the associated syndromes right like dysautonomia or POTS um Ehlers-Danlos syndrome um you know just there are so many different uh PANS PANDAS like they're just these Alzheimer's. weird Alzheimer's disease right I mean there's all these conditions that are vague symptoms I think that what we understand very for a long time in chronic illness is one being ill causes a lot of anxiety in the patient and um two um doctors follow patients for a long time right i i you know had a, a new had, had a friend in um, durham in north carolina who um, had ms like disease for 10 years and she was so excited when they finally confirmed ms i mean it, it's crazy right it's like Finally, she was like, I would, I was proved, I was proven right, right? I've been sick all this time, but she never quite got there. Um, I think that happens a lot in, in chronic disease, you know, you um, especially when doctors don't have concrete um treatment protocols or ways to make the patient feel better. Um, I think that's really challenging. I think it's very stressful for doctors and a lot easier for them to refer the patient on. One of the first Bartonella studies we did um patients had seen you know I think it was like seven to twelve doctors 
you know, on average across before they got a diagnosis and effective treatment protocol. This is all the gaslighting is so extensive. I think it's real. I absolutely think that it's more prevalent with for women, for example, than men. But I'm also very well aware, Rich, that women are the primary healthcare consumers, whether they're doing it for themselves or their family. Um, they do the caregiving and they're also advocating for themselves. So they have a, they're, they're more likely to be gaslit in the first place because, um, but just because they're out there doing it. And I think it's a shame. I think it's tragic. And I think the amazing work that I think about Brian Fallon and John Alcott, one of the, the first research those two went out to prove was quality of life. There was something measurable, concrete that was different for chronic Lyme patients compared to others who recovered from the infection. And when they were able to demonstrate that there was something measurably different, it gave credence. These aren't hypochondriacs. These aren't people you should be referring to the psychiatrist. It's incredibly important. The next step is to be able to provide lab evidence that, that infection is there or that something else is going on, right? That is can be addressable and we can bring relief to, to people in these struggles. So Nicole, as you know, as a as a past co-host, it is it is your right to either make the final statement or ask the final question. So I'll I'll turn that over to you. So Amanda, the question that I would have for you is: Wait, do you, you want me to ask the final final question, or you want this me to ask? This is the final final question. Final final question: If a loved one came to you with a tick biting them on their leg what would you recommend so that they would not have to face the suffering caused by chronic Lyme or other tick-borne illness? Um, I would send them right to the doctor. And based on the conversations I've had, they probably would get um, a, a you know prescription for, for doxycycline. I would hope it would be 10 days and not the single dose that the CDC is currently recommending because I don't trust that. Um, but I think the first thing I would do is calm people down depending on where they got the tick bite send them to the doctor, get that dose, they're probably going to be fine, right? If um, if they aren't, that's when I would tell them to come back to me and I'll help them out. <laughs> get them connected to the right people. And, and, and encourage their doctor to use Galaxy Labs for all tick-borne disease testing. If they testing, absolutely. Them. Although I'll say most primary care physicians are not testing um at initial presentation they'll just they're, they're pretty happy to do prof antibiotic prophylaxis and that i would recommend that like don't wait just go ahead and do this um but where we come in again is is when you were missed the diagnosis was missed when uh treatment was failed you know in a case of possible acute infection where there's any ambiguity absolutely come to galaxy we'll we'll get you hooked up I'm glad I had to throw you that softball there, Dr. Elam. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't thank you, Nicole uh, Bell, as always, for being an awesome member of our community and co-hosting with me today and, and bringing to us Dr. Amanda Elam, who was an awesome interview today. Thank you both for uh, joining us and thank you both for doing all the great work you're doing for folks in the uh, tick-borne disease community. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much to you both. Yeah, it's always fun.